Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, thank you. It's great to be with you. I'm Kristen McDonald Sakota, and uh, as the bio said, I have the the pleasure of serving as the director of the Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture, as well as the moderator for today's panel titled, How Should Arts Institutions Navigate the Culture Wars? Um, so I wanna just start by kind of reflecting a little bit on my tenure and my role right now in leading arts and culture for Los Angeles County. In having the privilege to create this department, I was able to really steer a vision that we are bringing to life of arts as vital to civic life. And so when I think about all of the reasons why we invest in arts and culture, it's pretty incredible and still very profound to me, um, but also speaks to a lot of my calling as somebody who works in not only the arts, but also at the intersection of government, philanthropy, and cultural and public policy. We invest in the arts because we know that the arts, of course, are an incredible, joyful thing to behold and a great sector and full of entertainment. But we also invest in the arts because we know that creative expression is a human right. And we invest in the arts because we know that the arts contribute greatly to quality of life and healthy communities. We also know that here in a place like Los Angeles, um, the arts are part of our economic prosperity a huge creative economy that is actually $200 billion of output every year for Los Angeles County alone. We also invest in arts and culture because often there's been a lack of access or some of our communities and our cultural forms have been historically disinvested, excluded, or marginalized. And I also want to say that it is critical that we think about investing in the arts because the arts help us build towards social change and the narrative change that we need if we're going to advance social systems. I'm excited to be joined today by four incredible leaders in the arts who are doing incredible things in their fields and with institutions they have led. And we're gonna hear a bit from them uh, about why they're investing in the arts, but also how are we thinking about this incredible power of arts and culture at a time when many of our communities may be in crisis at a time when perhaps even our own democracy is in crisis, um, or at a time even when our institutions may be in crisis. So with that, I am uh, excited to uh, introduce our panel. So Joanna Burton is the Maurice Marciano Director of the Museum of Contemporary Art, MOCA, in Los Angeles since November of 2021. Burton has been active in the contemporary art field for more than 20 years including more than a decade of leadership experience in major museums, prominent arts and education institutions. As an art historian, curator, writer, and educator, Burton's past posts include her tenures as executive director of the Wexner Center for the Arts in Columbus, Ohio, Keith Haring, director and curator of education and public engagement at the New Museum in New York City, director of the graduate program at Bard College's Center for Curatorial Studies, New York, and Associate Director uh, and Senior Faculty Member at the Whitney Museum uh, Independent Study Program. Um, she was also a 2019 Center for Curatorial Leadership Fellow. So that is Joanna. Let's give a round of applause. All right, now the next person I'm gonna introduce is Snehal Desai. He is the Artistic Director of Center Theater Group. Uh, which is one of the largest uh, performing arts and theater companies in America, right down the block here in Los Angeles. Previously, Desai was the producing artistic director of East West Players, designated an American cultural treasure by the Ford Foundation, and the nation's largest and oldest Asian American theater company. While at East West Players, Desai produced and directed the three highest grossing and most attended shows in their history. And as an artistic leader, Snehal sought to raise awareness of the social issues that affect Angelinos through impactful and powerful storytelling. Most recently, Snehal was on the faculty of USC's graduate program in arts leadership, teaching executive arts leadership. Please join me in welcoming Snehal. Nationally recognized, award-winning artist and artistic leader Nataki Garrett was the first executive artistic director and the sixth artistic director of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. 
She's the first black female in this role and the first in the country to lead a $44 million producing theater company. In 2020, Garrett worked to save OSF from closing by raising $19 million. She created the professional nonprofit Theater Coalition to help nonprofit American theaters advocate for access to the $15 billion Shuttered Venues Operators Grant. And while at OSF, Garrett conceived Quills Fest, a fully immersive digital event intersecting XR and theater. She executive produced three films, including the Sundance award-winning film, You Go Girl, by Sharifa Ali. So please join me in welcoming Nataki. <laughs> Last but not least, Adam Weinberg has served as the Alice Pratt Brown Director of the Whitney Museum of American Art since 2003. During his tenure, the Whitney has presented dozens of critically acclaimed exhibitions on diverse emerging, mid-career senior artists and created award-winning educational programs. It also experienced exponential growth of its permanent collection and dramatically expanded its performance program. Weinberg has curated exhibitions on dozens of 20th and 21st century artists, authored catalogs and lectured widely. He serves on the boards of numerous arts organizations from Terra Foundation for American Art, Storm King Art Center to the American Academy in Rome. And in 2024, he will be a presidential fellow at the American Academy in Berlin. So please join me in welcoming Adam and all of our esteemed <laughs> guests. So I want to, you know, start, and we're going to just try to have a, a good conversation. We've got like plenty of questions here, but I'm sure there's so much wide ranging stuff to talk about. Um, but I want to share just briefly a story that I recently shared with Snehal. Um, I had the opportunity to sort of set a little bit of a frame. I had an opportunity recently um, to participate in the World Cities Culture Forum, which is a forum of public sector arts leaders from around the world who gather uh, annually to share best practices um, and really promising strategies in advancing arts and culture in our cities and our regions. And uh, in an effort to continue to expand and grow, one of the newest members of this uh, organization was the city of Kiev. And so as we gathered in Sao Paulo, Brazil, um, with members from all over the world, our colleagues from Kiev had traveled 55 hours to be able to be with us and hold court together on the power of arts and culture and what it does. And in that conversation, I walked away with three really poignant reminders, I think I'll say, but that are really rooted to the arts in conflict. They talked about the importance of power and power of culture in building connection to identity, to our communities, um, to each other. But they also talked about the weaponization of culture cultures being eradicated, um, culture uh, as a means to destroy, um, and the importance then of preserving culture. And finally, they talked about the power of arts for healing. How do we heal civic trauma? So in thinking about these three themes, the culture of connection, but also the weaponization of culture, and arts for healing. Um, we're gonna take those three themes as we begin our conversation. So the first thing I'm gonna ask is really to talk about what are some of the ways that you all work in arts and culture and create connection? What are some of the ways that as you led your, your institutions, that a cultural institution creates civic connection through the arts? And I don't know who wants to go first, but... Joanna? <laughs> it might need to be you. Thank you all for being here. It's a real pleasure to be invited and to be on the stage with this great group of people. I, I might start with the obvious. I'm looking at Adam was a mentor of mine um, who I worked with for many years. And I think um, in terms of community building, we have to acknowledge the people who gave us the space and who trained us and also in many cases um, gave us room to disagree with them. I didn't disagree with you that much. But I think generationally, this idea, right, of, of bringing people on to a stage that may do things differently is really important. Um, but where I wanted to actually start is I started as an art historian um, because I really wanted to find a space for public and civic discourse. And for me, that was in the academy um, until I realized that actually the work I wanted to be doing was directly face to face with artists. And so I began curating, um, and that was a space that felt like I was able to produce, um, or at least try to produce space for those I believed in to articulate their practice. 
And then at a certain point, um, it became really clear I should lead an institution. The more that I have um, moved through my trajectory, the more I aspire to sort of disappear. It's not a great career move, I will say, especially as a woman, to try to get less and less visible, um, which is maybe something we can talk about. Um, but I actually started through the lens of education, and so did Adam, so did many leaders who are ascending these days. So I would say in terms of civic space and how one engages, I would really point to the radical promise of education, which is often a word that, um, to use another of my mentor's phrases, covers a multitude of sins. When you say education, people, some people think you mean you know, K through 12. I do mean that. But it also means what space do we produce, not only where we teach the audiences that come into our institutions, but we learn in turn. And I think that's where I would want to start is um, for our institutions to have a place in civic dialogue, we need to be prioritizing that listening. And I think that is a very, very difficult thing to have happen institutionally, but I think many of us are um, working in that way. And that's, that's maybe where I would start um, in, in terms of answering your question. Thank you. Go ahead. I think, of, um, and I actually, first of all, thank you, Joanna, um, for your nice words. But um, I think of community as really beginning at home and modeling community. And um, I think that if you don't have community within the institution itself, there's no way that you can have community in a larger sense. So it's making everybody in the institution are giving people the opportunity to feel valued within the institution. That means that everybody is part of the larger project of the institution, whether it's an engineer, a maintenance person, a person in communications, an assistant, an intern, that as they feel more empowered to um, uh, achieve something collectively, then changes can start to happen. And I think that that's, at least in my experience, it's been the process of building community within so that you can create community without because then people feel it. I mean, I mean, my happiest moments sometimes have been in the museum as when I'll have somebody who's in the elevator who is in, uh, you know, maybe a curatorial assistant or, or um, an engineer and they're holding the door open for everybody, welcoming them to the museum because they feel that it is their museum, not my museum not just the artistic people in the institution, but everybody has a stake in the success of the institution. And that, to me, is where community begins because people start to feel that, and that's what draws them to an institution. Yeah, um, as we were also talking, I mean, so many of our uh, artistic spaces are communities, like, you know, when we think about the music center, that's a county space, when the previous institution I was at was a city space. So um, many of our arts institutions are on communal properties that are collectively owned, but they don't, they haven't welcomed communities in that way, and they haven't fully ex embraced being a civic space. So I think a lot about that, how everyone can feel like they have a sense of belonging and um, a sense of shared ownership and responsibility to these spaces. Um, and what can we do to make sure that those barriers to access that have been there traditionally, you know, are minimized as much as possible? Um, the other thing is, I always think, as an artistic leader, I, all art creates community around it, and I'm looking for those artists who are seeking to empower the communities that they come from with, through storytelling specifically, um, but also to help us bridge the divides. We live in such a polarizing time, so who are those artists who are trying to show the other side of a story or a narrative that maybe we have not been introduced to? Um, and I think all great artists also, artists are who they are because they also are outliers or outsiders in a lot of ways, right? They're able to step outside and hold up a mirror to all of us. Um, and so it's creating a space for them to feel comfortable to tell their story and then to welcome new communities in. And just to add a little bit to it, I um, uh, have always sought to create spaces that um, support the most vulnerable amongst any kind of population. Um, so this speaking to this idea about access and why people feel like it's a, these spaces are a space of access or why they don't, and really kind of looking for ways to shift the invitation. Um, uh, if, if I know that I'm invited, then I know where the door is and I know 
where I can, um, how I can get there. And I know that when I sit in a seat, I'm sitting next to somebody who recognizes that I'm supposed to be there. And, um, and, that, and, and a lot of times I think the sort of generational divide in a lot of these spaces is uh, because you have a group of people who have been taught that they were, they are the, they, they, it belongs to them. You have a group of people who have been taught that it doesn't. And so it's really about, uh, these barriers to access I think are also about expanding invitation and making sure that um, we're creating spaces where the most vulnerable within a population in, in however they come, that they also know that these are the spaces for them. And uh, from, from my experience, when you're serving the most vulnerable, then everybody gets served. But when you're serving the, um, uh, the most privileged, then actually they're the only ones that get served. Thank you. And that reminds me, um, I often sort of think when, when these topics kind of come up, if you're familiar with John A. Powell's work, an incredible leader um, who works uh, at the Belonging uh, Institute, and he's just a bit done incredible work around the notion that really, he says, the problem of the 21st century is othering. The idea that we have made certain parts of our collective human race other to us to distance them or to not feel empathy to their problems or to exclude, right? And he says, but the answer isn't saming. The answer is belonging. And he talks about the importance of places like arts and culture for bridging across difference um, and really being able to build a sense of belonging. So I think this is super interesting. Um, and um, we've got lots to talk about. But if anybody had, I think the only other thing is I heard you know different things about when people are polarized. I heard this interesting stuff from you, Adam, about creating community within the organizations as a means of even having kind of that vibe. I wonder, does anybody else have any other kind of strategies or specific things you have seen in leading cultural institutions to bridge difference, you know, across different people? Well, I think, and you know, and I can only speak for my museum in a sense, my former museum, and that is that we have this responsibility, and you're referring to the responsibility that we have, the responsibility that, that people feel themselves reflected in the, in the culture of the institution. I mean, just the culture and in the art and in the programming and everything within the institution. And part of that, a big part of it, and I think we'll get to this question anyway, is that we have to be incredibly self-critical in order to, because if we, as soon as we take for granted that we are presenting the view or a view with a capital A, that's a problem. So it's always a process of being self-critical even as we put forward statements because we are institutions and as institutions, we can't help it. It's taken as a statement even if we don't want it to be a statement. So therefore, we have to always be second-guessing ourselves and not be frightened by the self-criticism or criticism from without but try to take that in and say that's an opportunity, not a not not um, a, a negative. I think one of the things also also to think about is there are um, within the theater world um, the systems were not mm, the systems were created to support one kind of leadership, and so when you are bodied in in the way that the that that system was created to support. Then, um, then the way that you sort of cultivate shift and change and support and uh, the way you sort of adapt your organization to the shifting times actually tends to move with you a little bit more than if you're not bodied in the way in which those systems were meant to support. Um, uh, and so when you're not in that body, you're constantly, I mean, I remember having conversations with people where I had to, I had to stop for a moment and say, you, you do realize that I'm not, uh, that this is a directive. This is not a suggestion. And it's a directive because as the uh, leader of this organization, I have full scope. I can see everything. And my answer to whatever it is you're asking me um, comes with the, f the totality of that scope. Um, and people would still be looking at me like, right, it's so interesting that she would think that she's telling us what to do. Um, and that's because the system was never set up for me to lead it, right? 
And so I think the other thing is when you're looking at systems that, um, that support, that, that support shift from within, the first thing you have to think about is are you willing to break those systems? Mm -hmm. So that they actually can serve to support from within. Um, and that's a really, it's, it's a really tricky space to inhabit, this idea that you might break within to, to create systems in which you can actually promote shift and change. Or something as simple as less harm. Yeah, and I think as you're, the other thing is that this all ties into um, models of scarcity and privilege, right? So um, you not being included and me being there gives me a certain privilege in this world, which goes to colonial ways of being and capitalist ways of being. And there's just this, the exclusion factor is what we started to put as a paramount value, right? That we can only have a few number of people and they should be a select view versus it's okay for everyone to come and it's okay for us to gather in this other way where the lights are on and people are talking back at us and we're in one room together versus you sit quietly in the dark and you know clap at the appropriate moments when cued. Um, and so when you try to break those apart or when you try to break artists and who break that apart, um, you know, then other things, other levers get pulled, right? I think the other big thing is tied to all of this is the economic models for these institutions, which is intertwined with the behaviors at those institutions. And are we gonna be able to democratize that? Because that's what's ultimately gonna shift these institutions in terms of the value sample. I guess I'll just add that um, many of us, I think, came up during a time when institutions were being heavily questioned visibly. Institutional critique is something that I learned about as a grad student, um, but also the importance of institutions, right? Somebody like Andre Frazier would argue that you protect the institution by critiquing the institution. Mm -hmm. So these questions aren't new, but what is new and what we talked about in the pre kind of discussion that I thought was really interesting is when new leaders are hired now, they perhaps aren't hired to build a thing, they're hired to fix a thing, and what that distinction might mean. Um, and I went through the Whitney Independent Study Program twice, and I helped run it, and this question of revolution versus reform is something that constantly came up. Do you fix, do you fix a thing, and who's asked to fix a thing, versus do you tear a thing down and rebuild it? And if you rebuild something, is it necessarily better? So I do think one question for today that I've been thinking about since we first met is um, when we're talking about institutions' relevance and the work they can do and the impact they can have, are we embarking in fixing? And what is fixing? What are we fixing? I think to your question about structures. And if we are given the privilege of building an institution, what would that look like? Because most of the contemporary art museums, at least the ones that I've been a part of, sort of began around the time of huge social big social crisis, but with a lot of promise, the feminist um, and civil rights movements, um, the Vietnam War, right? The 60s and 70s produced a lot of these institutions. I'm not, I'm curious, I'll leave it hanging in the air. Are we fixing or building? And if we're building, what would we build? Um, my fantasy, by the way, is to have a group of people I would handpick and just, we would be the staff <laughs> for that new thing. Um, I think everyone on the stage would be in that group for me. <laughs> so, um, I don't know, I just want to sort of say fix or build. Yeah, I love it. So I'll take that and just say, um, well, it's interesting because I kind of think it's all building, even if you were hired to fix, because you're still kind of building something new. But it's also because I have a deep belief that there is no objectivity, no true objectivity, and it's sort of the way we're sort of taught sometimes that, at least when I grew up, I was taught like history is objective. And then later I was like, no, it was not. It was like, really? totally not at all. Um, and that there isn't really, and that sometimes I think in our society, the approach to, to things, to places, as if it's a tabula rasa, right? So even when people are like doing community development, well, we're going to build over here because there's really nothing happening. And it's like, actually, you're not seeing that there's a lot happening in that community and there's a lot going on there. But um, it's kind of viewed as a top that there sort of is no tabula rasa. So it's all building. But what for me, but what you're saying is also interesting because from where I sit in sort of more of a cultural policy lens, we have a similar conversation about are you an advocate or an activist? Because those are two different things. Um, and we see that a lot kind of in our world, especially with, with independent artists as well. Um, sometimes folks want to be activists and tear something down, which is different than advocating for something specifically that you are hoping to build. But to take this one other kind of notch further, I also want to recognize that there is 
you know, we're in a we're in a specific moment in time. And so one aspect of that is even who we are um, as people and who a lot of our colleagues are in the field. We are in the midst of a sea change in arts and cultural uh, leadership, um, whether it's philanthropy, uh, positions like mine, cultural institutions, where there are so many more women um, and leaders who would identify as leaders of color, for example, in a lot of these roles. In LA, there are a significant number of women leading uh, museums and leading major organizations, for example, um, not to mention you know, the leaders on my right and my left. So we are part of a real sea change happening, but I also, as I mentioned on our call, have noticed that in addition to the fixing, sometimes people being brought in to fix, and that's when a risk is taken for someone to be brought in or a woman to be brought in. I also have noticed though there have been high profile announcements and then sometimes some quiet exits only a short couple of years later with a sense that the person's vision or their change agenda was not always supported. So I know this could be a topic of interest <laughs> to some of our folks on the stage. So I just want to ask, I'm going to ask it this way though. I'm going to ask it this way. Are leaders as leaders of change or are leaders of change, are agents of change able to work within the systems that support the arts as we have them now? Or must we change the system to make any other change? Is that the only way forward? I don't know. I would just say that it's it's hard to talk in such generalities. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's it's because and, and I mean somebody frequently people say to me, um, um, what is the state of museums? And I think to myself, museums, I'm my museum is as different at yes. MOCA as MOCA is from LACMA, which is from the Asian Museum, which each of these, it's, and it's not that we don't have commonalities, but I think to try to treat it, and I think it's one, I, and I, this came up in the panel, I think with um, also with uh, Kathy and Suzanne, this guy, when one tries to talk in such broad strokes, that's to miss the problems. and. Mm. Um, I, I think that one has to start with where each institution is, and then each one of us is different and is going to have a different approach to doing it. It's not to say, again, I really believe there have to be commonalities, because if there aren't, you can't build these bridges. On the other hand, each situation has to be taken and then molded based on the conditions of that community, that, that, that institution, its history, its past, where it is in all these different ways. So I, that's where I have it. So, to, you know, you're the dichotomy, but I think that we're always building and we're always, um, uh, uh, what, what was the other term? Fixing. Fixing. I mean, I feel like my job is to kind of, it's like being a potter. You tear it down, you build it back up, you tear it down. And, you know, and actually it's part of the reason I retired. I got tired of tearing down and building up in this particular situation in a way. And again, referring to Kathy, what Kathy said, it's, it was time for me to make room for somebody else to do that. And I had answered the questions or had posed the questions that I felt best able to do. I don't think this answers any of the questions, but I guess. It's fascinating. I think though in the, in the, I think that we can speak in generalities in some fields, because I think in the American theater there is a kind of um, uh, general re re repetitive action of um, hiring the least likely to come in and, sh and sh and save it, or change it, or shift it, or do all those things. Um, uh, I, as as a black woman leader, I've never um, been appointed to a position where I didn't have to clean up the job to move into it. And that's normative, right? So if you think about the history of black women in this country and uh, why we were brought here, brought here in the first place. Uh, there is a, um, a this point of extraction, you know. So it's normal, like you, like I'm supposed to go in and clean it up, right? That's a normal, that's that's normative. That's connected to capitalism. That's connected to the fact that my body was actually the bedrock of capitalism. Um, and so when I do go into a space and I clean it up to move into it, uh, the work that I've done there, whether it is building or not, is uh, perceived as normative. And therefore, nothing special, just another day in the life of an organization 
that needed this cleaning woman to come in. I come from a long line of domestics. I don't say that pejoratively. So it's important to recognize um, in these moments of sea change why an organization is moving towards a certain kind of human, right? And why they're not moving towards another kind of human. Um, and then you also have to sort of look within those institutions to determine whether or not all of the constituencies that help to hold that thing up, are they all on board for that shift and change and fixed and milled? And are they, are they interested in that? Um, are they prepared to support whatever it takes to clean it up even? Um, uh, or are they, are they sort of looking at their watch, trying to figure out if you're gonna, are you gonna be finished in, in time for them to take over and do the thing that they want to do? And you're talking about a cross sector. So this is something that I've noticed as well. Um, and in some conversations that I've had, there are a number of black women who were appointed to uh, nonprofit cultural institutions, philanthropic foundation institutions um, over the last maybe eight years. And a number of, of black women in particular, uh, women from all backgrounds, but black women in particular, a lot of, a lot of us are not in those positions anymore. Um, and so if you think again about the history of black women's bodies in this, on this land, um, it, it would seem normal, historically, that that's how it works. Um, and it, it doesn't matter if you have really good ideas to shift systems or ways of breaking something down and you can actually remodel it and build it back up. If the, the role that, you're, in, that, that uh, you're intended to fill is the role of fixer cleaner, that's what the, that's how you're gonna operate in those spaces. Um, and your vision, however grand it is, or small it is, or reflective of history, or doesn't matter, it's going to be tied to that. Um, and that was true in the late 90s, there were, um, was it the late 90s, or I think it's the late 80s, there, were, uh, there was a group of, of women who were hired to run theaters uh, across the United States in the nonprofit theater sector. And uh, they were all white women, maybe 15 or 16. Um, and then like within five years, there were five. Um, and if you talk to any of them about what happened, the first thing they'll tell you is they starve you out. Because you're there to do something, and you're, uh, you're in operation. And when that operation is complete, or when they determine that you're not actually going to do the thing, the operation, they get you out of there as fast as possible. Do you, want to, do you have anything to add on build or fixer? Or are we, are we going to shift? OK, shift to something else. Okay. Can, can I just add one? Because I think this is such an important point. And, and I also, the nuance of fixing, which I totally agree with you about. It, I think what's so interesting to me about it, I agree, fixing and building can be interchangeable. But there is a, at least when people talk generally about the field, people talk about cultural institutions through the lens of a deficit, that they aren't enough, right? And I think. To be able to come at, from whatever position you're in, um, a leadership position through the lens of, of fullness is something that we haven't had, some people ever, and others, I think right now, kind of across the board unevenly. And I think that that is just something that's quite interesting to think about. Like, whoever you are, or whoever the institution is, what is the um, kind of a patina that, that settles of of sort of resources or understandings of deficit versus surplus. Um, so I, I just want to add that on because I think what you're saying is really crucial. And I think um, to follow and talk, you was saying the first thing they will do is they will weaponize language against you. So that is the first way they're going to attack. So I was just looking back at um, it's a rite of pass. I don't want to name the blog, but there's a rite of passage of certain you know, conservative right-wing blogs that when you come into these positions, they want to nail you to a certain way. And it's the difference of, of saying everything you're doing is woke versus saying what I'm doing is visionary. What we're trying to do is that. I just I love the earlier panel where there's all this, uh, uh, you, the word activist is loaded up, but the word citizen means something different. And to me, an activist is a citizen always. Um, and or it's a thing of community organizers versus coalition builders, right? Or community. You know, so, if you see that, that's the first thing you have to call out because that's what they're doing, right? Every question, 
every interview I got once I got the job is, is your program going to be woke? Are you going to be politically correct? Right? Every time. And it takes a while for us. And now it's, it's on record. Right? It's, yes. <laughs> right? That is what it is. And that they, because they want to they wanted needle the divisions, right? What we're trying to do is build bridges. What we're trying to, but they want to nail you in a certain way and they want to build a divide between you and the community that you're trying to create. Um, and that's the way that has to be called out. That's what everyone in this room can do, is you can raise, you know, you can challenge that and you can change the wording and you can change the terminology about that. But if you don't do that, then we're just out on our own there, right? Fighting for that. And that is what I think alignment and support can mean um, in those ways. But I just think that the weaponizing of the language is the first way constantly that they, con they, that they continue to kind of pummel us, particularly as leaders of color who are coming in. The second thing is they try to instill in us an imposter syndrome, right? That you're there because, you know, you're there because the institution is failing, someone needs to come in, or you're only there because it's not doing well, right? And they realize that they have to change, which none of that is true, but that's the, do that's the narrative that folks have just easily lulled themselves into, and that's why all of this is a long game, right? All of this time that it, it takes five to 10 years to do these changes, and it's all cyclical also. Memories are short, they want change to happen fast, and so that's the other thing that as we do this, you know, uh, Nataki and I have known each other and I'm following in her heels, right, in this, the gap, and I'm seeing the same things that you talked about years ago rear up. And now it, it's just, what are we gonna do to, sh to shift that? And I often find it's just the folks who sit by in silence while we're dealing with these things, and it's how can we empower you to join in that? Beautiful, yes, snaps for that. Um, and so many incredible things have come up in this that I'm like, oh, which one do I grab on? I just wanna acknowledge and sort of like pull out a little bit something that's come up in all of these uh, reflections, which is that any job in leadership, but in cultural institutions in particular, there are a number of constituencies you are trying to support, cultivate, coalition build with, manage, supervise from your board of directors to the staff, to the community, to the artists, to, at, to your funders, um, right, I'll be in that camera. Um, and so I think the interesting thing about the call to action that Snail just gave is that that means that actually the influence game, if you will call, if I'll, if I'll call it that, the narrative game, all of that can sit in any of those constituencies. And so it really is not only sort of when you talk about the institution or when you write about it formally in a newspaper, it's actually with the funders, it's also with the board and also with the artists and the staff. It's really in all of those places um, that this uh, kind of kind of conversation comes up. But since you use the word weapon, I'm gonna kind of go um, towards a little bit more of that. I wanna reflect a little bit on even the name of our panel today. So our, our panel, um, which is about navigating the culture wars, one of the interesting things um, for us when we first kind of met, and Adam, this came up with you, is for many of us will remember something about the culture wars as a specific moment in time, in US history in particular, um, where artists really were being uh, essentially censored. There was a lot of censorship. I mean, we're talking about um, artists, the NEA, no longer could give individual artist grants, whether it's Maplethorpe or whether it was um, Elizabeth Finley and others like that. And so that was a very specific point in time. Um, even if it never fully ended, there was a whole wave of things that happened, um, many of them in the 80s, um, a lot about First Amendment, about censorship, um, and about government funding for the arts. Um, and about what is obscenity and things like that. But that seems a little different than the notion of culture wars today, where we're really talking maybe more about a sense of polarization or what I have come to think of as almost a democratization of like ways that you can attack culture. So now anybody in your neighborhood can just go to the library or register a complaint with the school and not having read the book, um, get books and authors and Amanda Gorman's poems literally banned and pulled from our civic institutions. So I feel like, and or anybody can go on social media and like say whatever they want. So I would love to hear from you all about just the notion of culture wars. Is that, how are you thinking about the context that we're in today as you're leading a cultural institution? Does this resonate with you? Or well, I, I, I don't even use the term culture wars now. I mean, to me, it's so historically specific and 
I think the comments that you're making, to me, it shows you how deeply embedded these things are in different areas within our culture. And not, it's not sort of a simple, um, uh, never simple, but I mean, kind of, here's the big bad people in the government and they here were the artists on the other side, which was very, it was very much expressed as a kind of binary thing. And if you could only get rid of Jesse Helms and the world would be all right. The problem is, the Jesse Helms of the world are everywhere and they're under rocks and they're all under, I mean, they're, they are in a sense. And that's what makes it hard because you can't even talk about boards across. I mean, I'm sure in your various experience, you've had board members who've been great allies and great supporters, board members who quietly tried to take you down from within. Um, uh, and you find this in every level, whether it's funders, whether it's board members, whether it's staff members and I think, you know, and, and going to Snell, which some of the things, it's about trying to find allies within various communities to help work. Because I think, I think again, I think when we make things in a sort of binary way, it's much harder to really see it for what it is and understand that there are potentially allies in lots of places and there are quote unquote enemies in a lot of different places. I don't know, that's a generalization. But. I agree with you. I remember having this conversation at one of my institutions, so that I'm not specific, um, uh, where uh, we were, there's, there's a, a million dollars on the table, and the person who was funding that um, uh, has a historical record of using the resource that they give to institutions to hold, to, to create stasis, to hold things in place, right? And so I, I said to my colleague, you know, if you take that, um, you just have to be prepared to lose three times as much on the back end, right? Because that person is not looking for a way to advance this institution. That person is looking for a way to hold the institution in place. Um, and and I, as, as again, I, I, I have to go back to this really clarifying this idea of, of culture war for me can, can be a little bit more complicated by the fact that uh, oftentimes my physical form is the point of war, right? So you're automatically set to disagree with me because I'm a black woman. And even if, if in the conversation I express something that you agree with, the um, uh, disagreement with agreeing is, is what the next, is the next thing that I've experienced. So uh, I remember at, with the PNTC, we were in DC and some of my colleagues were saying, you know what we want to do, talking to our lobbyists, we want to reach across the aisle. We'd like to, we'd like to have more meetings across an aisle. And I had to say, you know, actually, there's no across an aisle for me, yeah. right? There's, I, there's, I don't get to come up to an, an aisle and be like, you're on that side. I'm automatically on the opposite side of that aisle. Um, and I also want to say one more thing about this idea of culture and war. Uh, one of the things I've noticed as both a uh, participant in the arts, somebody who, 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 um, uh, who steeps my life as an artist in, in arts, but also I go to see art and experience art, um, uh, I'm so clear um, that with the way some audiences uh, engage, I'm so clear that um, I'm, I'm not supposed to be in the room or somehow uh, my being in the space is, is an anomaly. And, and I'm an, I'm, I, I do art for a living. So if I feel like that, I feel like there are people who don't come back ever into these spaces to um, uh, participate because uh, they don't feel like it's a space for them and so the culture war is also about making sure that certain people don't feel like it's for them. I, I literally create a space of, of, um, of, uh, of uh, make people uncomfortable by making sure they're clear that this is not their space. And I can do that in all kinds of ways. I've witnessed um, assault in theaters. Um, I've you know, people hitting other people, you know. Um, you know, snapping at people, glaring, glowering at, at, at other humans for the way that they are experiencing what's happening in front of them. Um, and all of those are sort of, and, the, and, and that's in you know, like regular everyday 
uh, response. I've seen that um, regularly. So there's, we can't say that there isn't uh, an internal culture war that's happening within these spaces. It is happening. And your audience members are participating in that. And they, because they're a part of the world, right? So they go out in the world and they have these experiences and they bring that, that energy back in. One of the things that I sought to do at my last institution was democratize the arm seats. Like, like, so if I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my arm here, I, I wanna make sure that I'm, I'm sitting next to somebody who um, wants to just have a shared experience with me. Right, that's all I wanted to do. It was like, just, can we share this armrest? I don't need to do anything but that. And, and that's hard, you can't really do that, you know, if you don't have a, um, a constituency that's interested in engaging in those ways, right? Um, when we changed the ticket pricing at OSF, one of the things that came back repeatedly was, well, now that the ticket prices are so low, I just don't know who I'm gonna be sitting next to. <laughs> Full quote. So it's like you go, okay, I, that's who, where we are, right? The culture war is a real thing, and so the historical culture war is one thing, but the pendulum can always swing back. It could have happened then, and, and we can use the same language for, for now. Um, and they can say it's about woke, you know, um, I'm, uh, I come from a culture, the culture that invented woke, which is about being vigilant so that you didn't get killed on your way home from church. That's what woke was, right? So it swung back, and now it means something else. We have to remember the, where, where that comes from, there's a real significance and importance, and we can't uh, bandy it about as if it doesn't have real meaning and impact. So we are in a culture war, um, and it's playing out in every theater, museum, and in civic spaces, you know, in, in these spaces that were built where people can hang out at the park in front of the theater, and you have uh, unhoused people in these spaces and you have this sort of like, why do I have to step over this, like get over there and, right, you have that, that's actually a part of this culture war, you know? That's all a part of this culture war. And you're, what you're also bringing up for me is how this is meeting a moment of real challenges in the performing arts industry and the theater industry in particular, where we are seeing not only the pandemic and a real uneven recovery in our creative sector, um, with especially those who, who really are centered in live arts, um, who couldn't just you know, shift to streaming immediately and then have actually all their you know, profits go up, um, that we really are seeing an uneven recovery. But there's also these longer term trends and questions of what's going to get an, au an audience off their, their butts <laughs> when they could just be at home eating popcorn and, and watching Netflix. And so in these conversations, I actually have heard people saying that sometimes some places are hearing, I don't want to be challenged. I don't want to be told that I am bad or that this is too woke. That's not going to, I literally like there is this kind of backlash yes. happening for some that they don't want to go to have an experience of that nature. So anyway, that's, I find that really interesting because that's sort of where this polarization or this pendulum swing is also meeting a really specific moment for our, our theater and performing arts uh, sector in particular. Yeah. And, and for museums who are seeing 30 to 35% less attendance mm -hmm. and are having to meet that then with rising admission costs, which mean less and less people can attend the museums. So the, it's performing arts, but it's, it's every cultural institution. Um, just to sort of yeah. point to what happens, right? Which is that you can serve less and less people because you're charging more because less people are coming. Right which is a circle. And then that's where we get to the fixer part. <laughs> because we have people saying, well, how do we address this? Do we have to have blockbusters to get, but do fewer of them? Do we have to have co-productions and partnerships to manage the costs, right? How are we kind of moving into this? All right, but let me just let, does this side of the room have anything else you want to say on sort of culture wars or polarization? How is this coming to your doorstep, literally, as an institution? Yeah, and I think I just want to, Again, culture war, so much of what is happening today is setting up a binary, right? And so much of human existence is about the gray area. And so culture war is obviously just does that because it, when you say war, you have factions and then you have a winner and a loser. That's right. That is how war That's ends, right. right? And so you're just set up in a way that someone's going for a win and someone's going to lose. And, and there's no, it's, and so that's to me, my that's exactly my objection to the binary in it because then there's the assumption it's about the aisle that there is an aisle there and that's not the case. 
that is winners or losers, and that and that's just a kind of capitalist model that just says, well, if I win, you lose, and you can both win, you know. It's a zero sum game. Exactly. 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 And yes, and and a sign of weakness is coming to the table, is compromise, is truce, is anything in the middle, exactly. right? Any of that is a sign of loss or weakness. Um, and, and they look, and if you are a leader who tries to lead in that way at these big institutions, that is sign of, oh, they don't know what they're doing, or instability, or weakness, versus this is the way I operate in the and world, I would say, this is what I'm trying to do. And I'd say as a white male, it's even hard for me to get the board and other people to feel vulnerable, to be self-critical. I mean, I have certain privilege that I even have real challenges doing it. Um, uh, but I can't even imagine what it's like if you're a person of color trying to get that to happen. But it, it goes back to one of you were saying, it really is a long game, and it is a marathon, and it's more than five years. I mean, I was the director of the Whitney for 20 years. I honestly think I really was not making much headway until after the first decade, I mean, in a really meaningful way. And I know that sounds like either I'm really slow or the problems are really bad, and maybe both were the case. But um, it really is a long game. I mean, this whole process is a long game. And, and, and this is where the notion of building together and working together, even this is a part of that process, is us talking together to do that. And everybody is part of this conversation today. And that's where the hope lies, is that we lay it bare and then try to figure out where are those gray areas that people can build. And it isn't, it isn't, it isn't a win or loser situation. Which goes back to your question about, you have a number of people who are, um, who are being appointed into these positions and then within, before five years, they're out. So they're, they're, you have to be, who gets the opportunity to, uh, to continue in the work to actually bring vision to the table? If you're, if you're brought in as the cleaner, you don't. Well, and that's the, the promise of, because I want to say promise of institutions might be to work differently, not only within our own institutions, but with each other. Mm -hmm. And I do think it's possible, but it is, um, we don't have that model yet. I mean, there are some, See, and they're burgeoning, but they, I think that's where we have to It started head. to happen, at least I can speak, in New York during the pandemic, yeah, because right. the institutions are notoriously, at least I'll speak in the museum field, were notoriously competitive with each other, and during the pandemic, everybody had to admit weakness. Everybody had to admit that they didn't know what the hell they were doing. Everybody had to admit that they were frightened, that they didn't know when they were going to open again, whether they were going to pay the bills, etc. And all of a sudden, guards came down and the conversations, all the museum directors in New York um, were having conversations online that I saw, you know, kind of admissions and vulnerability that I never imagined. And actually, it was a hopeful moment. I hope it stays because there are ways in which it is remaining. Um, uh, but I do think that, you know, the admission of of weakness and vulnerability is an incredible strength. I really do. And I think it's something that our culture does not prize, you know? And it goes back to what you're saying, the winner loser thing. I want to pick up on that beautiful phrase that Jonna uh, just said, which is talking about the promise of institutions. And, um, you know, I think next year I will be celebrating, I suppose. I will be recognizing 15 years in my own career, 15 years in leadership positions in the public sector, in the arts. Um, and so I think, you know, I have to admit whether I, you know, I might ever say this or not, but that I must have, right? I do have some strong sense of promise um, in institutions, of promise in the role of the public sector in supporting the arts, that I actually believe it is critical, um, and that I will wave this flag of arts and culture. And of course, I believe deeply in the promise of arts and culture as part of a thriving multiracial democracy and our aims, maybe as a country, that we have espoused as our American values, but have never fully realized and are still on this journey yet. So as we think about the promise of culture and institutions in that, what are some of the things that we're building towards? What are some of the goals you had for 20 years? Like, what are some of the things you're actually, that you are really excited about or that you're working to, to build? How do you see that playing out? Um, I just wanna, you know, the other two things that, um, and I'll 
answer your question. <laughs> it, one, the other thing that's interesting about this times we live in is that there is a um, as, absence of a monoculture as we know it, right? And so, and around that, there used to be the central nexus of truth. And now, what is true, <laughs> right? We've been destabilized in such a way that that's what has made it hard to come together in mm -hmm. common spaces to have a conversation. And I think there is, you know, something, there was always something dangerous about a dominant culture or a monoculture because it kept so many of us out. But now it's how are we going to create what, like, where are we going to find common points of connection mm -hmm. is the real, you know what I mean? Is I think the thing, the, the question for society moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to give, you know, Nataki a huge, you know, props for, she created this professional nonprofit theater coalition in a time of need, as did so many of our arts institutions. And what she was really advocating for is that we are providing a public good. And so in to avoid this, um, access of privilege to our institutions, the funding for them must come back from, from you know, from on the state level, on the government level, on the local level. They're the only ones that can help us because we also have economic impact, we are also employers, but we provide a public service to our communities to create these spaces, to have, you know, to have a dialogue and to humanize the, the troubles that are ailing us, right? To talk about social, social isolation, about mental health, around, you know, to put a face and a name to a cause what we do as storytellers. Um, and the experience you can have at home with Netflix is great and grand and you can get up and you can go to the bathroom, but is it transcendent? Is it cathartic is the question, right? Why we gather is because there's something in that communal experience that can't be. And in a time where we got used to masks and questioning who we were and crossed the street when we saw someone because we were worried they were, we have to find our ways together again. And what we're finding is that there are just so, some people so comfortable with those divides. It's that, you know, my seat is in first class, I don't want to be back with everyone else, right? And, I, and my money buys me that privilege to stay away from you. But what the pandemic showed is no one is safe in that way. And you are a human, you know, everyone's bodies are vulnerable in the same ways. So I just, those are so much of the things that we're thinking about. And then I just keep thinking about, um, how we can lift up the artists that are doing the work and also take the work out of our spaces. Because that's the other thing is that our spaces are fraught with their own histories. They are on stolen lands. What can we do to create community out wherever we are with whatever it is and then welcome folks in um, over time? And you know, to me, that's what I'm thinking about. It's also mm -hmm. how we can cross genres in the storytelling, how we can make work that is mobilizing folks into action for the greater good. Mm. And I feel like you did, whether you meant to or not, you kind of did still speak to the, <laughs> to the problems of institutions, but in different ways. On the one hand, you talked about the fact that essentially, and I don't think this uh, came up as, as much uh, uh, as I thought it would, but in this moment or in the past four years, we are coming out of, or still in, a series of multiple crises. So we've had a health pandemic and a health crisis. We have had an economic crisis. We have had the Surgeon General, as you just referenced, of the United States say that we are in a moment of social isolation, a crisis of social isolation. We have a continuing epidemic of violence and gun violence. I mean, literally multiple crises. There's a mental health concern for youth. So in the midst of all that, what is the role of the cultural institution? But it, what's interesting is I also am hearing you talk about the idea that even truth or institutions themselves are being questioned, it also kind of pulls the, the threads. And some of the promising things happening are these coalitions being built outside of institutions. We have a theater uh, artistic directors of color uh, coalition that you are part of. Um, I'm seeing coalition building outside of institutions by artists and other leaders as one of the things that people are doing to actually move through this time when all of this is being kind of questioned and pulled apart. So I know we only have a couple more minutes before we're gonna take questions from the audience. So with this kind of final thinking about the role of cultural institutions in this moment, um, or in supporting communities in crisis, or looking ahead, any anything else anybody wants to, to offer before we start to go to the audience? I mean, I'll just pull out something you were starting to say as well, which is artists are more crucial to culture than ever before. There does seem to be a silver lining that that's recognized more, I think, by people, though it is valued less, I think, potentially. So the financial kind of aspect of um, people want to 
um, see the place of artists as our greatest commentators, I think, especially at social moments um, like this one, but they are also expected to produce a huge amount of labor without necessarily the same kind of financial benefits. So I think institutions are necessary, at least at this time, as providing stages and contexts and frameworks and histories and all of the things that artists need as laborers that don't have those, um, those kinds of undergirded um, structural support otherwise. And to me, that's very powerful. Artists, when I go and, and have teenagers in the space, artists show that you don't have to be content with the present you live in. You can look elsewhere and you can, you can build. And to me, that's um, why I get up every day despite um, the, the complications. So I think we, could, we couldn't be more relevant, but we also need support more than ever before. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, the co-artistic director of an initiative called One Nation, One Project, and the project is called Arts for Everybody. We're working with 18 sites across the country um, uh, some of them are health institutions that implement some sort of art um, to, you know, to, to help support them with the co social cohesion. They're actually uh, prescribing art as a part of their, their, uh, the health work that they're doing. Some are municipalities that are looking for answers. The, and some are arts institutions that are, um, that are uh, engaged with health and municipalities. Um, one of the things that's exciting about it is uh, how many communities that we're in where they're already doing this. They're not asking the big question. They're, um, they're looking at the need within co community and they're meeting that need. Mm -hmm. They've just made decisions about how you meet that need. And one of the things that, that I keep getting in the feedback from some of those sites is people are engaged in our practice all over the world, all the time, everywhere you go. Um, uh, what, what we've done is we've created these hierarchies that sort of determine what is art and what is not and what is fundable and what isn't. But people are engaged in these ways and what they need is a way to recognize that what they're doing is actually activating um, their own rights for their own existence in the world um, to be healthy, to be connected, to be engaged, um, and, to, and to expand their understanding and thinking and learning. And uh, these organizations are activating that within, within communities that have otherwise been discarded by municipalities or um, that, are, that are in rural parts of the, of, of the country where people um, often forget you fly over, you don't go into. Um, they're activated around water, around, around uh, teenage suicide, around gun violence, around you name it. And um, around the fact that there's no grocery store for miles and miles. Um, around health and, and that part is I think the most exciting and all of them have arts at the center of their engagement. So there is a, a consciousness across the country that this is really important, this engagement is important. Um, it may not have, it may not hit on the institutional level everywhere, but it, it is, it is um, embedded in, in, a, in our society in, in these important ways. And then just something just came to mind is that I remember Monty Bunch said not so long ago, um, something to the effect which got me really thinking that that um, museums he was talking about are not community centers, but they need to be the centers of our community. Mm -hmm. And so what is it that separates the arts organizations and the way they provide need? And what are those needs, those larger needs, those spiritual, those psychic, those ethical, those you know, moral kinds of needs and how, and it goes back to the, the about multiple truths and not, I mean, there, there is no objectivity. There are multiple truths and having respect for other truths and how do you negotiate those truths, sometimes when those truths are conflicting truths. Um, and I think that that's, that's the great thing going, I think, to what Johanna said. I mean, I think that that, to me, has been the joy of working with artists because artists always have surprising responses to the things that the, it's the unexpected thing that you don't see, that you don't do, that you want to ignore, you try to ignore, you try to even bury, and then it comes up and hits you behind the head, and all of a sudden you go, shit, that's what it is, you know? And it's like that, and you know, we want to have such control in our society. And the fact is, we can see it now. That the only, you know, we're out of control in our society. And the only way to gain control is to accept that we can't be fully in control and to negotiate that. Um, and I really, I, th I think there is that way that you can manage things. You can't control them. You know. 
All right. Well, thank you for those uh, thoughts. And before we finish, we've got a couple minutes to take questions from the audience. I think there are some Zocalo folks who are ready. Oh, OK, great. Um, we have time for one question online and one question in person. Uh, and then we'll take Hello, you can hear me? Great, awesome. Uh, we have time for one online question and one in-person question. If you are interested in asking a question, please go to the left over there to see Moira. Our first online question is for the group. A new generation of leaders are now at the helm of major institutions. How do, young, how do younger leaders convince their governing boards? <laughs> convince them of what? Um, How do younger leaders convince their their governing boards? Yeah. Convince your governing board at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so I don't have a board right now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't either, so yeah. I could yeah, too, yeah, but yeah. I don't. I mean, yeah. Yeah. You want to go? No, yeah, after you, please. Yeah, I. Um, uh, it, it really does depend on convince them of what, but also if you are um, a newly appointed leader, uh, there, the agreement that the board made is that what you were bringing to the table is what they wanted. Um, and sometimes you, when you when you say, oh yes, I do, I want all of that, I want a, I want a full plate, you know, um, I want all the things you said. Sometimes when you get that plate, you go, oh wait a second, I only want to eat the cranberries, I don't want to eat the rest of this, right? And so uh, that's this point of engagement where you're, um, where you actually have to be prepared to be in a dialogue about, you know, the things that you're trying to do together. That it's not the board versus the leadership. It is all of us together, um, the constituencies, the board, the leadership, the donors, everybody working together um, for something that is um, bigger than the moment that you're in and bigger than yourselves individually. I would say that it's also know thy board. And what I mean by that is that, is that you know, most leaders are selected because there's a search committee. The search committee exists of three, four, maybe seven or eight people. Um, so the majority of the people on the board don't fully really know even what they're getting. And they don't know what the search committee necessarily agreed to, per se. And um, I think that for a young person or a new person coming into something, I th and I mean that literally, know thy board, one really has to spend time individually with each individual board member so that you become humanized and they become human to you. So that you start to, at least if they're enemies on the board, so to speak, you know who they are and what, where they're coming from. I think that I think that there's so many Hail Mary passes that are made in terms of selecting leaders, when they, especially with failing institutions. So, oh, we'll try this one because that last one didn't work. And we know many institutions that have had directors of institutions for two years, two years, two years. Um, and that's because a lot of times they didn't even know what they were looking for. So um, I think you just have to really dig down deep and really, you know, if you have, and the thing is, if you're having two years, you don't even have the chance to get to know them. So that's the card stacked against you, so. I think I'd just also add um, that convincing is an interesting word because it, it presumes that, again, there's, a, there's an aisle. But also, um, you know, Boards are set up, or have been set up historically, so that you have a body that sort of looks at itself and each other. And to Natalie's point, it's about the institution once you're all gone. And so I think having that longer view of what an institution's North Stars should be, and might be, or could be, is really crucial. And um, you don't start to map that constellation for a minute, for sure. Um, so I, I've been trying really hard to live in that um, zone, not with my board, but just in life, of conflict does, isn't necessarily a problem, right? You, can, you should and could push up against each other's ideas and get to a place where you're learning. I don't think consensus is a great model. We've seen that in this country. And I, I, just, um, I would just say what I've, the most important thing I learned about my board was 
make them comfortable with discomfort is that they have to learn that conflict is the nature of the game. And if they can get comfortable with it, we can do something interesting. And we as leaders have to too, <laughs> which is hard. And that's also just the, the structural insanity of the nonprofit or the 501c3 model, right? You have a bunch of people who are the governing body um, and you would never have a hospital run by people who have never worked at a hospital or never doctors, or the same with a bank. And yet you have a f- bunch of folks who are in charge for the lead, you know, governing and choosing the leadership who most of them most likely have never worked at an arts institution or been a performing artist or any of those things. So I think that is a larger thing that is a conversation. And then I think the other thing is you have to know yourself and your brand and your true north and stay to it. And it doesn't talk, he said, you can know what your brand is and you can have got the job because you were a certain way. And then, oh, okay, you're gonna continue to do that? You're gonna still be that person? Yes. <laughs> and you just, that is who you are. And that is, who, you know, and it's, it's a dialogue and a conversation, but you, can, you have to be prepared as a leader to not, to know where the line is about compromising yourself. And that is every day, I mean, that is where oftentimes we talk about values and values work for leaders and stuff like that. But you have to know what the line is for you. And then you have to know what the line is for the institution. And that is a collective one with your board. And in crisis, let me tell you, all of that gets pushed and tested on a daily basis. Other than all of that, it's all very easy and everybody should want to do it. (laughs) Exactly. You all said it all. I I would have said something about sort of uh, over time, especially if this is someone talking about younger leaders, you do start to hone into what is your personal mission. Literally, what is my mission through all of this work and dedication that I am doing in life? And then what am I doing collectively with this institution? And what part of the journey um, is this going to be for me, right? And then the other thing I love um, that reminds me of what you just said, Joanna, is just yesterday I was meeting someone we were talking about for, for future us. Because sometimes you are, you're planning for future you. Sometimes the best thing you're going to be able to do in your tenure at that institution is protect it from budget cuts. Like literally stewarding what you have, stewarding it for future you and future communities sometimes is actually a goal um, or making the changes that you're not going to see in your you know, time, but hopefully will live on beyond you. The final question is to your right. Yes, go. Yeah, Marcus Slimmer, I'm the chairman of the board of um, uh, Bill Aurora and Thomas Mannheim, so I'm one of these board people that uh, <laughs> you complain about. And um, first of all, um, welcome back, German ambassador to the US, Mr. Michaelis. So uh, I'm glad to have you back. And um, boy, I wish we had some institutional leaders from Europe listening to this discussion, because oh. I think you can be a leader in Europe especially in Germany, you can have a cozy life without doing anything of the stuff that you mentioned. And I think uh, we have the institutions, but you have the innovation. But there is one elephant in the room that you've been dancing around, I think, and that is, finally, if you want to win the nav- or navigate the wars, even if you don't like the word, I think it finally boils down to what's happening on stage, uh, what's happening on the museum floor, and what's happening in the concert hall. And I think this is an area I'd be interested in getting to, to hear a few of the, of the words, because I also tend to admire what's happening here in the US, being interested in classical music, opera, theater. There was an um, interesting article in the New York Times two weeks ago saying how California became the center of the classical musical world. And, uh, and I think they actually won here in California by taking the bull by the horns and being edgy, new work, developing, spotting new talents, um, finding the new composers, making them relevant. Um, and, and I think for me, it's what's your experience with that? Um, uh, because that is the stuff that we are also looking for. We don't have that in Europe. Our institutions very often are sort of museums. You have the innovation here, and I think um, maybe you can touch a little bit about the content, what's happening on stage, instead of just sort of wandering around. <laughs> any reflections on <laughs> any reflections on the, the art that's being created, produced, presented, or any of the themes that were just raised? I mean, I would just say that the, you know, the opening up of, of all of these institutions to diverse artistic visions and approaches has been really incredibly 
enriching and growing for our audiences. I, and um, even those who might disagree with what we're doing, they're changed by it. And um, sometimes, um, uh, um, you know, anger is the, compa is the companion of change, I think, as Han Hanya Yanagahara said, is that, that it's okay to feel angry at things, but I think that, and, and I think that the institutions, and I would say, you know, I spent relatively little time out on the West Coast. The New York Institute is a very conservative group of people. Um, and I do think there's a certain openness here that one might find. Um, and that's not to say there aren't wonderful things happening in New York institutions, but it, 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 I, think, I think it's a very exciting time in the arts for, from my point of view personally, and I'm seeing things and aware of things that I hadn't seen before. So I don't know how to answer that in two seconds. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a few things. Um, okay, so first of all, we're not complaining. I, you know, board members are also our advocates and our biggest donors and the supporters, and you're doing it because you love the art form. All of us, I think, have been on board at different points in our life, and we can provide that perspective. But the other thing is, my first in-person staff meeting was a layoffs meeting. I can't get to the work yet. I have to raise 20 to 40 million to get to a place where I can do that. And along the way, I have to compromise this vision that I went through nine months of the search process to talk about. I can show you where we can go, but there's so many things. And then on top of that, we have to navigate all of this other stuff of, who, of my identity, of who we are of all these labels that are thrown at us. So I think it's, you know, it sounds great. I may move to Berlin and find a job there if where I could go to is the art making. But it, you know, some of it is question, you know, the biggest buzzword that I've seen as an exclusion is, is excellence. What we want is excellence. Well, that's the given. Isn't that the given? And I don't know anyone who doesn't want to create work that isn't excellent. But in the investment of the life of an artist, they're going to create work that's amazing, and they're going to create work that's really bad. And that bad work is going to feed them more on their journey and the work they're creating to get to that next thing. And we have to, I, I think we're all thinking about all of that, how we can make the relationship with artists less transactional, how we can make them home, uh, how we can uplift them. But I think the trouble for us is we are being thrown into these things where we have to think creatively to get to any place to open our doors to do anything. And as we're thinking creatively, all you constantly get then is a barrage of, what do you mean everything you're doing is free for two months? What do you mean you want to do stuff outside? What do you mean you want to work with other institutions? What do you mean you want to talk about community? So it's, it's all tied together. And I mean, we're artists. That is what I want to do, right? And that is where we want to go. It's just not an A to B to C proposition anymore. And oftentimes we are being brought in at that moment, and when we try to dialogue about this, then everyone gets affronted. And that's what's, you know what I mean? I think that's the honest dialogue that sometimes folks, like, you know, that is really, really challenging for us to get to that. And that is also why it takes five to 10 years to get to that vision. The, the music scene and the art scene here in LA did not transform overnight. It took decades. Right, and it took decades of unquestioning investment, right, without strings to get us there, and that that is where it's all tied together. Um, and and I do think as artistic leaders, that is where we are in a creative proposition. We're trying to make you know what I mean, gold out of straw right now, um, in any way. But that's also where the opportunity is, is to welcome new folks in um, to do that. Otherwise, it is all just. But we also don't have a public funding model. That's the other thing. I, the, Whitney, the Whitney Museum of American Art gets less than 1% of its annual budget from any governmental source. So therefore, and I would say 60% of our support comes from wealthy individuals. Yes. Not corporations, not foundations. It's probably closer to 70%. So that's why the obsession with boards perhaps seems, and, and by the way, I actually think overall I have a wonderful board. It took, and I'm not saying that because I'm no longer there, it doesn't matter, but, but it took a long time to create a board that felt comfort with these difficult things and to understand what that was to learn the mission together, what the mission needed to be for the institution. So I think to your point, we can't even get to that point if we're financially really weak and the people who we're counting on to give us the money don't even understand 
entirely what we're doing. So it takes years to get that trust. And, and at the same time, every single one of us is programming full speed ahead so that we are both raising the money, building the boards, managing the people, and trying to do an excellent program. <laughs> I, would, I would just add, add, oh, I'm sorry, sorry you go ahead. No, you I was just going to say, when I took this job, actually the one before it, one of my mentors said, get ready to be really lonely and to think about everything but the art. And just to be completely in alignment here, um, it is, it's a daily struggle. To, and this isn't a complaint. It's just, it's administration. It's firefighting. And this isn't unique to my institution. I actually think my institution is really strong and I have good relationships with my board. But it really is the biggest challenge is the paradox of getting the program that then allows for the funding to come means you're thinking about the program very little of the time. And I, I, I thought the elephant in the room was gonna be something much, I'd love to talk about the art on my walls all day long, actually. Um, so if the elephant on, in the room is, is the program, wow, we should have another panel about that. But I think it actually bears out that what we're talking about are the kind of structural support mechanisms that we so desperately need to be working so that we can do the work that our communities really want. Which for me goes back to the systems and why the systems that uh, we're in, the systems that we use to make art are actually um, reliant on 70% coming from individual donors. Um, not a lot of money comes from the foundations even though the foundations are, are supportive and, and giving as much as they can. Um, and, they're, and because um, that pool of individual donors tends to want to sit next to their friends, um, there, there's a hold on um, whether or not there's seats at the table for other donors, other people to come to the table with their resource. I remember being in a meeting with a group of people who I was trying to cultivate who were not donors to my organization, and they were like, well, you know, like, because we got as much money as they do, but I don't, I, you know, like, why, why are you coming to us now? when you've never come to us, right? So it's, a, it's also about um, expanding the donor pools and, and looking at all kinds of people and their resources. Because right now, the primary donor pools are really literally trying to figure out if they want to give your theater the money or if they want to buy a seat on a sinking submarine. And they're trying to figure out between those two ideas. Literally, that's the conversation that you're in the middle of. I think the other thing is, and, and um, for me, it's really exciting, but it's troubling because we are at this time where the artists are, uh, with their ears to the ground, are engaged in full conversations with a group of people who are not coming inside the, the doors, right? The work that they're doing reflects what's happening, the zeitgeist, the actual zeitgeist. It reflects what people are really excited about or interested in or afraid of or what they're living through and you got a room full of people who don't want you to make them feel bad? As if they're not in the same society, as if they're in a completely different room, having a different experience. And my thing at this point, because I've been through it, is how dare you act like the work that the artist is serving is somehow trying to make you feel bad? As if you are not in this world with that artist and the audience that they're trying to speak to. How dare you act like that reflection has nothing to do with you? And that's the problem with, 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 with the elephant in the room this thing about the art, because if y'all don't want to see it, then you actually don't care who you're sitting next to. You don't want to be in it. You don't want to be in the world that you're in. I also just want to add one additional thing. I mean, y'all have just said it, but I think the American story is so much at the heart of it is actually one about still striving for our ideals and still really understanding what is true representation, what is true belonging, how do we actually build and redress so much of our history, whether it was referred to as native land or uh, being a black woman and slavery was referred to. I mean, all of these are still literally with us today and it's so much a part of the American experiment, so to speak, right, that we're still all on. And so the role of culture within that is really at the heart of what we do, whether we want to admit it or not. 
And so we know that that's so much of what our cultural institutions are grappling with, and it's absolutely coming out in the art. And I have to also say, especially from where I sit, that there is incredible art and culture happening in Los Angeles and in the Los Angeles County region. Has been for decades, y'all. Has been going on. Deeply, deeply present here in the Black Arts Movement. I mean, we could go on and on, but what is interesting as a shift in our country, though, is other people understanding Los Angeles as a place for the arts and not only, so to speak, a place for Hollywood. But we got it all. We are blasting content to the world. Think about the power of that in narrative change and in social justice. So that's what I feel like all of these incredible leaders are grappling with. Absolutely, it's on the stages, it's in what they're programming, but even in that, who feels that they belong, what's being represented, which artists, and then of course having to be executives essentially, and really um, <laughs> stakeholders uh, and balancing it all. So I thank you, I thank you, I thank, thank you, you for delivering and giving us all of it um, on the stage today. Um, and so please give me a round of applause. For this of their insight, their wisdom, and even where you all are in this moment and your connections with institutions. I've got a few uh, things that I just want to say. So thank you so much to Joanna Snehal and Nataki and Adam um, for this great conversation. I want to, of course, thank Zocalo uh, Public Square. And you will be able to find a summary of this conversation on ZocaloPublicSquare.org next week, um, as well as interviews and conversations with others and essays and more. So stay tuned. But up next, there is going to also be a keynote dialogue, The Future of Truth, with Werner Herzog and Paul Holdengreiber. And so with that, uh, again, uh, I'm Kristen Sakota. Thank you. It's been an honor to hold the conversation with you all. Thank you. And everybody have a great, great night, and let's hear this upcoming keynote. Thanks. Thanks.